So I'm going to spend 20 minutes talking about oral history data, but actually we're going to be mostly focusing on, on the tech side and, uh, and our experience of serving users for the last 20 years or so. So I'll tell you a little bit about my organisation, what kind of collections we have, some of the issues in locating and discovering data when you've got a lot of it, a lot of it and then bits about trying to represent context. And it was really nice that Echo gave a good introduction about the epistemological issues and challenges, so I don't have to go into them, <laughs> so, so thank you. Okay, so um, yes, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who's using what and why, because I think it's quite nice to set the context of the kinds of users that, that we're working with. A um, bit about our own discovery systems and how people get hold of data, and then um, publishing data. So a little bit about my organization. We're actually part of the National Survey Archive in the UK. Um, it's been running since 1967 as a data bank, and it's had continued funding since then on five-year cycles. It's not a kind of solid archive. It has to apply for research funding every three to five years. But um, so it's had a lot of experience creating, curating social science data, and it offers a wide portfolio of services <coughs> through to research to teaching, um, and increasingly used for teaching and learning, actually. Um, so we run a national service which is supposed to be a one-stop shop for social scientists. It's a very broad remit, but it's what the funding council who, who fund us, which is the Economic and Social Research Council, so very much the so, uh, socio-economic uh, remit there, expects us to deliver quite a holistic service, which always has its challenges to try and please everybody. So um, our specialism is actually in survey data, in holding the big social surveys, and also some of the textual material that comes out of that. But we have a specialism in qualitative data and also increasingly in big data. So we're one of the archives now that's moving into the uh, kind of investigating what it means to, to host and curate and, and disseminate um, big data for social scientists. And we have a security standard registration, which means we can hold very disclosive data uh, legally. So that's our website data service. I'm not going to show you too much there. But just to say, um, we are part of a whole suite of a kind of sisterhood of data archives throughout around the world. And uh, we are part of a different um, network, a different ESFRI network called SESTA, which is the Council of European Social Science Data Archives. And it does work, well, it doesn't necessarily work that well with Clarin, but there are various people who are in both camps. But we were talking to Francisco later about there's quite a few common needs, particularly for access to qualitative data. But there's a whole group of people who do very similar things and they're housed in, in the National Archives um, for data. So a little bit of our service, because I think actually that the depth and the scale is quite important. We have about 6,000 collections of data. We have about 400 newly acquired collections every year, and we have um, about 25,000 registered users at any one time, which is a, an international you know, uh, portfolio. So it's quite a lot of activity on, on the website, and that's across all, all kinds of data as well. We also have a huge number of user queries. So there's about five people supporting users who are calling and asking very specific questions. And no matter how, how hard you try with uh, creating really good web content and everything, you still users want to talk to experts. So um, that's a big part of the work, actually, is uh, support and training, promoting data sets, teaching with them, creating resources, all those kinds of things. It's a big piece of our work as well, not just taking in data. So on the qualitative side, um, I've been involved in something called Qualidata, which was funded again by the Economic and Social Research Council as a completely different entity to the survey archive, like they often are. They start, you know, their, their, their ideas um, founded by sociologists. This was by Paul Thompson, who is um, an oral historian and, and wrote um, a book on the life history method in the 70s. He decided he wanted to create an archive of all the stuff lying around in the UK. Um, and he also uh, set up the National Life Story Collection at the British Library, which is a really good oral history archive. So, um, short amount of funding, then they decided there wasn't enough money, as usual with these, with these archival projects, and we integrated into the data service as a small unit, and now it's very much part of business as usual. So, in terms of demonstrating equality for data across quantitative, qualitative, the UK is a really good example of that, because in my eyes, all data is treated equally, and I think that's, that's really important. Um, but most archives are not like that. There's still the divide between the qual and quants, but I think the UK... We, we've managed to harmonise it quite well. Um, so out of 70 staff, there's four people who do the qualitative staff, um, on a, as, well as, as well as having other roles as well. But there are people, go-to people to, to, to use. And to say, um, not as I said, there are oral history um, materials in our collection, but actually the qualitative data is quite wide. It could be anything from observations of um, meetings, 
it could be uh, children's essays, um, it could be images, it could be anything, uh, self-directed writings, it could be anything like that, but the majority of the stuff, I would say 90, 95%, is actually in-depth interviews, mostly recorded interviews. That's the majority of material that we have. And just on the website, um, there's a pointer there to the, the qualitative um, collections if you want to go and have a look at them. We've got about 950. Seven. And these three are oral history collections. So the first one is our most pre prestigious one that most people who are working with us um, in the qualitative area know about. It's 450 life story interviews collected in 1970 um, with people born before 1917. So it's a huge collection. It's something like 50,000 pages, hundreds of hours each. Some, some interviews are nine hours long, all recorded on reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Um, but all the materials there, and it's all about you know all aspects of life during the Edwardian period. So it's a really rich collection, and it's been reused about 200 times for, for all kinds of things. So data's made available. At the moment, actually, we are struggling with making the audio available because it's massive. So we can give it to people, but it'd be really nice if there was a, a place to put it so that we could actually do that. And at the moment, we don't have the streaming capacity to, 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 to deal with that. It's not a huge use case for us at the moment, but it, it would be nice. And there's a couple of other collections there. So just to show you what people are doing, uh, we did some work over the last 20 years or so about what, what people are doing. So the green there is 64% are using it for teaching and learning. So a majority of our users coming to us, of the thousands you saw, are actually using things for teaching and learning, student dissertations, PhDs, um, teaching in the classroom. And 20% is for research, and the rest is other. Uh, we do have, you know, Gene genealogists coming in, uh, various people doing other kinds of stuff. But it used to be that actually 60% was research 10 years ago, and now it's, it's, it's less. Although clearly, teaching and learning is still, um, and actually research does include the PhD, so actually we're looking at more un undergraduate usage, which I think is quite interesting. And what are people doing with data? We, when we look at the projects, the, discuss the descriptions of what people are doing, they're doing all these kinds of things, and it really is, you know, some people are trying to replicate data, which we know is very hard to do with qualitative, qualitative data. Most people are actually um, asking new questions of old data. You know, they're coming to it, uh, as Jakob said, with a perspective. They're a medical sociologist, they want data on X, so that's what they're looking at. Um, and some people are hoping to do restudies. So we see quite a few people who are completely replicating the whole method 20, 30 years later or in a different region. So the more contextual information you have about the study, the easier it is to, to do a restudy, particularly if the investigators are, are not alive. So they're the kinds of things that people are doing. Also, I have to say, the, in terms of research design methodology, when we talk about context, we do try to take all the study materials, descriptions from the study, and a lot of people are just using them rather than the data. So it's quite interesting. So, so the development of method and the protocols and tools that are used are sometimes as interesting as the data themselves. And I think we don't always recognise that when we count users. We count downloads of data, but actually the other stuff's really important as well. Um, so just say we, we also just, because I think this is interesting, and I haven't seen much published on this, this is actually publications use, reusing qualitative data from the literature. You can see it's gone up massively towards you know, <laughs> the last five years, whereas before there was very little talk about reusing data. And again, citations have gone up as well, and that's, that's interesting that it's now kind of genuinely you know, approved techniques, certainly in the UK or in English-speaking countries. There's a lot of uh, reuse of qualitative data is, is quite a, uh, a known method in itself. Just to say that we have a huge collection. There's other, uh, the other archives have much fewer collections, but the Finnish data service is the one with, with the most kind of similar collections to us. Um, but of, of the 20 countries in the CESDA portfolio, there's only about five or six who, who host qualitative collections. The rest want to and don't have the resources to do it because you do need to dedicate resources. So it'd be interesting to see if there's any join up with any of the archives, if there's you know, groups of archives that actually can connect with the people in the, um, in the CESDA archives who, who want to do qualitative things. So I think there is some networking to, to be done. Just to say, we have three types of access conditions, um, completely open, safeguarded where there's a registration, and controlled where it's locked down and many gates to get through. And I think it's important that all of our data comes with a particular pathway in mind. Some data sets, for example, a lot of the, the audio that we have is controlled. It's not completely accessible because of confidentiality issues. Whereas uh, the, the, the transcripts of that or the, the, uh, um, the material deriving from it is in safeguarded. And sometimes we make completely open, anonymized versions so people can use it for teaching and learning. So sometimes we find 
three access conditions for the, for the same collection. So I just want to say, just move on a little bit to do with what a user's doing. So this is quite typical, I think. Um, there's a sociologist who's looking at, who wants to look at testimonies on, on, on health behaviour. They want in-depth interviews and they want text. They happen to want text because actually we don't get very much demand at all for audio. And we talked about the value of audio. Of course, we know it's important, but actually the users who come to us, the sociologists, the health researchers, they, they haven't got time to listen to audio. That's what they say. Although when we make it available, they do want to look at particular nuanced bits. But the, the, the starting point for them is often the words um, to see actually, you know, especially if you're scanning collections to see if they're useful or not. So they want to browse a catalogue um, uh, where there's a lot of studies. And of course, it's difficult to locate things that you really want. And we can, I'm sure, we'll talk about resource discovery later, but it's actually the big, biggest challenge. Um, so they want to find a collection that's useful. And then they want to find, they want to actually see if, you know, the, the, the terms they're looking for are actually in the collections. And that's quite hard to provide both kinds of um, searching, kind of deep and, and shallow as well. And then quite often they want to go into it to explore data online and then maybe take some data away and do the things they do with it in their own environment. So that's quite a typical use case for our users. Um, and then they may want to say download it, put it into one of these qualitative analysis packages, take it away, analyze it, and then publish with it. And they may, because of the big transparency agenda coming in social science, particularly in political science, they may actually be asked to, to kind of evidence their claims to pieces of data. So we see a, a demand for this happening more and more now. In political science journals, you have to evidence your claims back to data. So you've got to show the data that which is really hard to do for qualitative work. But it means then you could have data ex extracts that are live with a, an identifier that you can actually link back to and hot link in your journal. So I think that, you know, may, maybe that's not the case now, but it, it could be quite a common scenario for publishing. So I just want to get to the bit about um, searching across collections. So again, sort of typical things that people want for our, our users certainly. They want to know about the dates of data collection. They need to know if it's 1920s or 1950s. I know it's pretty obvious, I know. They may want to know who's done it. That's often quite important. They want a collection by Thompson because they know Thompson's work. They want substantive topics like Jacob talked about. They want you know, particular things. Um, and then they often want methods. So they do want to know the methodological approach because that will determine the kind of data. So all these facets are quite important. They're kind of top level things that people want to be able to search by. And then there's the item characteristics. And what by that I mean who's talking, who's speaking. Um, and it's critical for social science that you do know the attributes of you know, males, females, age, because you tend to be doing cross, uh, you know, kind of cross data analysis. And um, you know, they, they need to know whether it's written or spoken as well. So it's quite a lot of different attributes at different levels. And it is a challenge when you've got a, a thousand collections as to how you, how you get into that. So it's an example of our Discover catalogue. It's got a number of facets down the side. Because it's got all collections in there, from surveys to qualitative, we have a kind of data attribute. Um, we've got whether it's open or closed, the depositor's name and, and country and date. So there's some key things. There's more of those. And then you can select the data type. And it just gives you some, you know, put a search in and, and you can look at these. And then you go to the collection. But it's just quite high level because um, it's quite hard to locate data with a, with a thousand collections, I think. And then you just get your typical study level metadata that's using a schema that we use in social science called the Data, um, data Documentation Initiative, DDI. And all of the archives use that to describe their higher level collections. And it suits social science very, very well. So you get a record. You may say, God, I really still don't know what's in it. It says it talks about experiences of pregnancy, but I don't quite know if it's right. So the next level, therefore, is to be able to explore the data. So um, I, I'm not going to, you can go and have a look at this later, but actually we have a, a DOI for all the data sets at the collection level, which is really important, so you can cite them. Um, and we do some indexing as well, using a standard thesaurus too. And there's a European language version of that that all the archives use. It's got about 11 languages at the moment, and it's quite useful for social science. But clearly, it, all the branches don't cover everything. So it, it's maintained as part of CESDA work. Actually, it's quite useful. So just say, when we get to context, every single collection is different. It comes with different contexts. Some's not available, some is. This is just a typical example of um, sort of 50 in-depth interviews. How it's packaged up is it has a user guide, which is anything that the researchers got, anything and everything they've got, we take in and we 
create actually a, a, like a PDF of it because that's what people want, a kind of book, which is the methodology, consent forms, everything like that that, that comes in, we, we try and get. Um, we make a data list, which is just an inventory of the items themselves and how they relate to other items. A citation file, which tells people how to cite the data, and then a read file, which tells people what we did to the data or what's been done. And they're kind of standard things that are used. And it, it's, it is like a data factory, actually. All, everything goes through this as a first level. Data listing is really simple. The researcher creates it themselves. It's just an Excel sheet, and they're just creating various attributes. And every collection will be different depending on the sampling attributes uh, of what you have. There's an issue there about the more detailed they are, the more disclosive they are. So if you want them in front of the wall, you can't, they can't be too disclosive um, unless there's, it's OK to share everything. And then sometimes we interview researchers about the challenges and difficulties and context, um, and, and it's really nice to put them. And we also have got some, we actually interview people who've had the most challenging collections and deposit experiences and ask them to talk about what and why. And actually, Jane Elliott, who you had as, at the top, is, is interviewed there about her experience of depositing a collection. So I think they're really important that the context can, you know, whilst the investigator's still alive, you can get a lot from them in, in interviewing them and, and getting it down on record and, and spoken word from them too. So we also have a self-deposit system like other archives do, which um, researchers just upload all their material and it's very lightweight and it only creates a basic catalogue record. Um, at the moment, you, you can't search the files, but actually it's useful for getting data in quickly. And once it's in and published, it can, it can be enhanced if you want to do more with it. And I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about the enhancements. So before I do that, just to say, the audio we have, we don't have very much, and we ask for it all the time. Please give us the audio. We know you've got it because you transcribed. No, I can't give it to you. I don't want to give it to you. And often when they retire, they kind of do give it to us. But there's a huge barrier we need to get over with why people won't share this material. Um, because it, there are controlled environments we host. We have very disclosive government data in there, so there's no reason actually why it can't be put in. But it is a cultural thing that people are really worried to hand over materials. Although in oral history, we know they're often made available when the consent is there and people's names can be used. But generally, researchers are very bad at um, you know, even discussing consent and data sharing with respondents. Um, so there's a lot more to be done to, to guide them to say, look, not everyone wants their data to be shut down. Some people want their data to get out there. So it's converted to MP3. Um, we do archive in FLAC just to make sure that it's uh, an, an open format. And there's a very strict file naming conventions about you've got you know five lots of items for a particular person they've all got the same file names so I'm going to just go into you've seen the discover catalog I want to show you the uh, the interactive browsing system we developed because it's based on really nice optimized XML schemas and it's right once and published many times so it, it's really minimal to get actually data in there although the preparation effort is quite big so the other user journey, um, you put a search term in, and then you're, you want to search the content of text, the content of the transcript. You find the text, it's located, quick word and context. You can then browse around to see what's related, you know, images, audio. You can examine some metadata about that particular interview. You can go and visit the information easily. You can cite an extract and then other people can come and annot annotate the extract. So that's the system that we've built, although we haven't actually got to the annotation, partly because it's a huge amount of maintenance to let the, <laughs> the unwashed in <laughs> um, to, to come and annotate your materials. So we do have a number of facets, and this is very hard to agree on them, and depending on your topics, but for social scientists, it was agreed by a panel of people that they wanted these particular attributes. They're common ones, they're the ones that people want. You could have anything. But actually, there's, you can't have millions of facets, otherwise it's too complicated. So they're the ones that were chosen. Um, so again, it's a similar interface, but this time I'm searching on a term, and it uh, retrieves the term within the paragraph, which is quite straightforward searching, really. And then you go, to the you go from the extract into the interview, and it'll take you into the interview, which is using text encoding initiative to mark it up and to display various structural features. And it's got some uh, basic metadata about the interviewee and also more metadata in there if you want. And then um, here, you can go and download the whole collection because you might want to see everything else that's related to it. Um, there's other resources related, audio if there was, and documentation. So it's kind of 
a sister way of searching, but it's slightly different because it's taking you into the content. I think it is hard to marry these two, these two systems up. Um, it's, it's a challenge for the user, actually, to know where to go as well. So there, um, that's a link to the audio file, and they just play the audio in real time, and they can view a transcript. They're not, um, you know, they're, they're not um, paired up, but they could be. So that's other things that I think would, would improve on the system if you'd be able to see them together so that they're tagged. And then the references sit at the end, but all of this is done via XML. So we press a button, it publishes, it goes in. There's no hard coding of anything in the system, and it's really important that, it, it, um, that it, it's actually very easy to take um, collections in and out. No hard coding. And this is the paragraph level citation. We use the API citation for paragraphs. So you can locate a paragraph, you highlight it, you click a button, and you get a citation, so a human readable citation that is like uh, you know, extracts four to five in interview in collection with DOI. And um, if you use the URI, because everything's based on GUIDs, if you use the URI, it resolves back in there. So if I'm writing a publication, I don't want to cite an extract of text. I use the URI and it goes back in. So it's quite nice because the citations themselves have a, an XML schema. So actually, you could then build on annotating that if you wanted to. But we haven't done that at the moment. But um, it's quite a nice feature. I'm sure that other systems do it as well. But actually, people have found it really, really useful. So you've got some persistence to the extracts rather than archiving them and doing <laughs> linking them. So just finally, I'm going to talk about how much metadata, because you, know, you can spend a lot of time creating perfect metadata, but it is a huge amount of time. And it may be that that collection is never going to be used. So it's a, it's a horrible decision-making process. But sometimes researchers want to do quite a lot themselves. So I think you know, once you show them how they can publish data in a nice system, they say, well, actually, I can do all that. You don't have to do it. So it's trying to extend those tools and desires to, to people out there. And I think you know, if, you see, if you can show people a nice interface, then they'll want to populate it. If you can't, then they say, well, I, I, you know, I can't be bothered. You just take, take everything and, and deal with it. Um, so I think um, the idea of this kind of primary metadata and then additional things that can be added um, is important. Um, so th the important thing when we were looking at metadata is really to make sure known XML schemas were used. We didn't want to invent anything. Um, and there's very rich descriptive metadata for files, which could be audio or text. So really, you can keep adding various elements so that they meet the needs of that particular collection. And then every single, every single item has got a GUID, so it's got an identity. So every paragraph, well, ours is paragraph level, but you could use word level. So everything's got an identity, um, you know, the files. So then they can be used persistently and published to the web. So it's really important. Um, and I'm not going to really talk too much because if we want to talk about metadata and I'm sure we will later because some people, <laughs> some of us here really love metadata, but um, the DDI is very important for social science. Uh, TEI is very important for text. Um, we use about seven or eight um, elements there. And QDEX was developed with a few people actually as part of the DDI for allowing you to use um, file level description and connections between data. And it's based on other W3C standards, so it just does some um, various kind of relationship. It's not, it's not anything new, but actually it, it's really li a very limited subset of things. It, it's quite straightforward to use. Um, I think that's all I'll... Well, I just want to show you this one thing, because this is an example of some data we've got that's textual. It's essays. And they're handwritten essays by children. And it was when they were 11, they were asked what they wanted to be when they were adults. Um, and in the 70s, they all wanted to be <laughs> hairdressers, beauty models, and footballers. And now they all want to be, I don't know what they want to be like. They want to be rich, and they want to run you know, <laughs> computer companies, or they want to be celebrities. It's all very different. But um, the point was the researchers went back and said, we want to digitize all these you know, handwritten diaries. So we digitized them, and they were full of typing. They were full of errors. Of course they were, you know. So that was retained, because obviously that's really important if you're doing speech stuff. So just the TEI was used there to, um, to make sure that you've got the, the real spelling so you can then search. So those sort of tiny things, I'm sure, you know, I, I'm in a slightly different community to you, but the social scientists wanted this, and they don't normally pay attention to things like that. So you know, it has a lot of added value. And then finally, some 1940s text on uh, um, home intelligence and morale reports during the war, 
which were written about the state of the UK and whether people were happy or not. And it was actually a kind of observation done in the military. It's very interesting. And we've digitised a lot of these. Um, Steph, you probably like them because they're sort of <laughs> soldiers, <laughs> soldiers and things. But um, they really are quite messy to reproduce. But again, the TEI was used to structure things and then some of the metadata was put at the top. So they're, they're, they're quite nice. And then just finally, I'm going to say, um, in order to promote the use of data, we do go and collect case studies from people reusing data. And we've got about 170 of them. And we, ask, we say, we'll happily write, write with you two pages on what you've done and why and how. And I think it's really nice to give that potted view of what you did and what the challenges were, rather than all the tables and findings. So they're a really nice way of promoting data. And then finally, we do have a lot of interaction with bringing together users and depositors and discussing things and challenges. We do have quite a lot of teaching resources that are based on collections, and they really do, you know, they really do help promote data. And then we have quite a lot of information on how you can share stuff. So we do a lot of work showing people how to, how, how why they should share data. And then everywhere we go, we tell people they need to share data. So <laughs> um, I'll finish there. There's some more technical stuff at the end on the slides if you if you want to see it.